Welcome back to the McCann Dogs podcast. We are in season four, and today we really need to talk about something that has just recently happened and that is clouding some judgment, I would say. So let's dive right into this. So the Super Bowl just happened, and of course, that is always a very widely watched event and the halftime show of course is a very big deal Mm -hmm. and the commercial spots for the super bowl are a very very big deal and i think that was the premiere of a new commercial by amazon and instructor swanee is in the studio Mm -hmm. here with me today. i am hi everyone (laughs) we are going to talk a little bit about this commercial and and there's probably a lot of people who are listening who know what commercial i'm talking about first off did you watch the super bowl i did watch the super bowl and my team won yay yes yes excellent yes i i love patrick mahomes and i would have been so sad for him if he had lost i just don't want him to feel sad Oh, well, that's very nice of and you. And he, with his, <laughs> his, his um, upper ankle strain and uh, yeah, he was awesome. Awesome. Did you have any bets on it? No, no bets because okay. I knew they, I knew they were going to win. So there's no reason to bet. Oh, well, there you go. Right. No yes. reason to win plus, more money. Plus I have no money to bet anyways. So <laughs> I would have had to bet like, uh, uh, I don't know, maybe maybe Shannon's arm or her leg. I would have bet something of Shannon's. arm and leg. <laughs> I'm glad that you didn't bet then because I'm not sure you that I would have, have been able it. to pay off. You, well, you would have gained true. more arms and legs. Oh, that's what I, yeah. Yes. So maybe you should have bet my arm and leg because right. then I'd have three You'd of have each. Extras. That would be helpful, I think. Mm-hmm. Maybe. I don't know. I'd have to learn to rebalance. Anyways. Okay. We digress. Right. Yes. So did you see this commercial? I did see this commercial and and I've seen it since too on regular TV. Yes, Mm -hmm. me too. I've seen it several times. And the first time I saw it, and I know we were talking about this earlier this morning and we both had the exact same impression. So this commercial by Amazon starts out with a really lovely looking dog in Mm -hmm. their house and the family is going out for the day. And then the dog is left alone and the dog proceeds to get sadder and sadder and then decides to start demolishing the house, which Mm -hmm. of course, is very dangerous for the dog, very dangerous for the house. You know, not a good situation in any way, shape, or form. And then the next scene is the family with a big crate in the back of the vehicle. And my first thought is... Amazon, you nailed this. Right. Wow, like great job. This dog has separation related stress, potentially separation anxiety, or maybe mm-hmm. it's just a really bored dog who right. is getting into mischief, tearing apart mm-hmm. the house. Brilliant. Give it structure, give it a crate, make sure that it learns in a systematic way how to behave in the house before you then continue to leave it alone. So I was expecting the next thing on the um, on the TV screen right. was going to be, here's a Kong that you can stuff for your dog to keep them busy. Here is some, you know, background noise, music ideas for your dog to help them get accustomed Mm -hmm. to being alone for first short periods of time and then eventually longer. And I thought, wow, Amazon, great. This is fabulous. I just love this commercial. And then whoosh. The rug came right out from under me and I thought, oh, they went in that direction instead. And tell me what that direction was. Well, they bring the crate into the house and, you know, all the dog dog trainers are cheering until they open the crate door and out comes another dog. There we go, that one. Yes, it's like, no. Yes, I hit the wrong button. It was definitely supposed to be the want want that came after mm-hmm. that because this is probably not going to solve any problems. No. Nope. It's probably going to create a multitude of other problems. Right. So. My first thought was now they're going to have twice as much damage yes. in their house. Yeah. Now the house itself is going to actually fall down right. completely because there are two big dogs working on destroying it. Right. All right. So that's what we're going to talk about today in this episode. And unfortunately, this is a very common fallacy that people come to. And we've had many students over the years who have said, you know, my life is just so busy and I want to get my dog a friend so that, you know, he's not bored and lonely when I'm not home. And 
that may very well be a good idea for a well-trained adult dog to have a buddy and Mm -hmm. to have another dog in the house. And of course, I think it's really important to preempt this by saying that when you get a second dog or a third dog or a fourth dog or a fifth dog, or if you're, you know, (laughs) continue from there, hopefully there's there's not too, too many dogs coming into your home. But if you Mm -hmm. get multiple dogs, keep in mind that you are getting another dog for yourself. Don't get it for your other pets in the home. Don't get it for another dog in the home. Don't get it for the kids. You know, inevitably with kids, you are going to end up being the big heavy Mm -hmm. and taking care of the dog. So it needs to be a situation where you are happy with having another dog and you have the time and the capacity to put in some work, Mm -hmm. do some training and help the dog understand how to live in a house and how to live safely in a house. Because of course, it's more than just destroying your house. There's also all this potential for the dog to swallow things mm-hmm. and end up with blockages or potentially, you know, bite an electrical cord right, yeah. and jump up on the stove and start the stove up and set a fire. We've all seen these mm-hmm. videos like things happen. Right. It's so important that we take our time leaving our dogs alone and we don't expect them to simply understand how to exist in our house. Mm-hmm. And I think this is especially true if you're bringing in a dog that is a rescue dog because a lot of the times they're a bit older and a lot of the times people think that they because they're older won't get into puppy mischief which isn't untrue they won't get Mm -hmm. into puppy mischief but they'll get into adult adult mischief mischief, which can be a lot worse than puppy mischief absolutely they have a lot more strength and potential to do Mm -hmm. harm yeah Mm -hmm. and I think that this this fallacy that people think that they'll be able to solve any sort of separation related stress. And I want to be clear when I'm talking about this, that we're not talking about separation anxiety. If you are dealing with separation anxiety, this is really a situation where you need a professional to help you with assessment and a professional to help you with coming up with a training plan so that you can help your dog through separation anxiety. And, you know, it, it's unclear what they were actually trying to convey in that commercial in mm-hmm. terms of anxiety my guess is that they were just trying to convey a bored dog and a lonely dog right. and you know there's there's all sorts of debate that we could have mm-hmm. about um getting a dog and not having enough time for them etc but realistically that doesn't solve any problems anyways so let's talk about how we can make the dog part of our life without making them so dependent on us that they don't understand how to exist alone. So mm-hmm. what does that what does that look like to you? Well, we in terms of management, in training the, plan, like you're so so say you're bringing home um say you're bringing home a rescue dog who is a year and a half old or you know what, let's mm-hmm. say 3 years old. Right? Just okay. just for sake of argument, let's yep. say it's 3 years old mm-hmm. and you're bringing this dog into your life. What does that you know, the first few months of their life look like? Well, it's definitely going to be training. It's going to be, I'm going to make sure I I enrolled in um, some sort of obedience classes or online program. Mm -hmm. I want the dog to learn to, to trust me and to follow me and to, you know, just have basic, basic, the basic manners. Right. Um, I'm going to make sure they get proper exercise, uh, physical and mental. Um, and I'm going to make sure the dog is getting is used to being left on its own too. I'm not going to, you know, some with COVID, I think we were home all the time with that our dogs true. and yeah. the dogs never had us leave. But uh, as soon as I bring a new dog home, I uh, put them in their crate, crate, you know, they get their crate trained and I, um, you know, I go to the grocery store, I go out for mm-hmm. dinner, I leave the house, I go for walks. So the dog gets used to my comings and goings, not being a big deal. Perfect. And the, the crate, why are you using the crate? Oh, the crate is to keep the dog safe. Perfect. And my house safe. Yeah. I um I don't want to come home to have my my shoes chewed and I, I don't want to come home and go, did he oh, we had a dog eat um an SOS pad one time. Oh my goodness. And um you know, just he nudged open the cupboard and ate the SOS pad. Um luckily I was, you know, caught 
you know, I was there and, um, you know, we got the dog to the vet and the vet had the dog vomit it. But if the dog had eaten the SOS pad while I wasn't home, Mm -hmm. I wouldn't have known that. Yeah, exactly. And that could have caused a lot of problems. And I think that this is the thing that's probably surprising to a lot of people. And especially if you're getting an older dog, a lot of times people think that those are puppy things and the older dog will no longer be in a puppy state. So they're not going to be curious and they're not going to be getting into things that they shouldn't be getting into. And that is not necessarily true. You know, if our dogs are home alone for a long period of time and they're outside of a controlled situation and, you know, it's a, and it's, a, it's an entire other debate, you know, how you should set up your dog, et cetera, if you're going to leave them for an extremely long period of time. Obviously, we don't want to leave our dogs crated for these astronomical periods of time. Mm-hmm. But until they understand the rules of the house, it's really in their best interest to be created for Mm -hmm. the durations that you're gone. And this takes some time and it takes some working up to um, and making sure that they're in that crate and they're comfortable in that crate is all going to be part of your introduction of this dog to your home. And if you're bringing home an older dog, they're not going to be doing puppy things, but they're still going to be getting into things. And sometimes Mm -hmm. those things are a mystery. Like, I'm sitting here and I can't for the life of me figure out what would be interesting to eat about an SOS pad. I mean, it's steel wool with right. chemical cleaner yes. all over it. I think it was one that we had used to, you know, to scour the bottom of a pan okay. and then we put it back, uh, you know, on a tray. Uh, okay. So it had a bit of a food smell to okay. it. Okay, gotcha. Mm-hmm. And like, those are things that as humans, we would never think about. But if a dog is alone and they're bored and they don't know how to live in the house by themselves just yet, and they've got an eight hour work day, while you're gone Mm -hmm. to go, okay, you know what? I've slept for four hours and now I'm bored and I'm lonely and I don't know what to do with myself now that I'm awake. So now I'm going to go exploring the house and we never know what kind of mischief they're actually going to get into. So definitely you're, you're so well advised to use management tactics in the home until your dog is comfortable and they understand how to live by those rules. Mm -hmm. So going back to this Amazon commercial, you know, we've got this dog who is already tearing apart the house Mm -hmm. he's already either very lonely and bored and doesn't understand the rules of the house or he's already very stressed for being alone in the Mm -hmm. house and he's looking for ways to alleviate that stress so now we bring another dog into the mix and Mm -hmm. of course the implication in this commercial is that this other dog is going to solve this problem so Mm -hmm. what are your thoughts about that well they open up the crate and out walks this other adult dog and there could have been a dog fight Mm -hmm. that, you know, there's no guarantee your dog is going to like the other dog or the new dog you bring in is going to like the other dog. So that's something to consider as well. That's an excellent point. And well, the, this other dog is just going to join in the fun. I think they're just going to go around now as a team. They're going to have a team of hooligans running around the house. (laughs) (laughs) You got it. So I want to talk about, um, a, a little bit of a decompression period that dogs go through. So especially when they're older dogs, when they're being rehomed into a new situation, a lot of the times that first couple of weeks, you really want to provide structure and a lot of ability for them to have downtime and a lot of ability for them to just sort of quietly observe things going on in the home the last thing you want to do is bring home a new dog that has you know has history elsewhere Mm -hmm. and is going into a new situation and during what we call the honeymoon period the last thing you want to do is sort of introduce them to life and all the chaos that might be in your home because at that point this dog has just come from another world they've they've gotten used to different Mm -hmm. things and now all of a sudden they're in this sort of chaotic situation and some dogs roll with it really really well and some dogs dogs are very put off by it. Mm -hmm. And in those first couple of weeks, of course, we're setting a tone for how the dog is going to behave in our lives, et cetera. So if they come into the house and right away you think, okay, you know what, this dog is three years old, they're going to understand the rules of the house and you leave them to their own devices. During that you know, decompression period, if they are feeling stressed out, they're going to be looking for options to alleviate that Mm -hmm. stress. And of course, new home, new situation, that could mean anything for the dog. And Mm -hmm. it could end up being a situation where the dog does serious damage to itself, to the home, you know, and, and a lot of the times dogs will quickly get returned to rescue because the expectation of that dog coming into the home is something completely different than what reality actually is. Right. Yes. People often have such high expectations of dogs yeah that yeah, yeah. It just can't be met 
Absolutely. And our trained dogs, we can certainly have these great high expectations of because we have taught them how to exist in our world. Mm -hmm. But these dogs that we haven't necessarily gotten to that point yet, you know, they're going to behave like dogs. Right. And they're going to rely on their instincts to drive their behavior. And that unfortunately will often lead to things that don't work well in our human world. Exactly. Yes. Well, even um, if one of Shannon's dogs came to visit me, say Shannon was going away for a week and I was babysitting, I would bring them into my house, even though I know they're perfectly behaved in Shannon's house, Mm -hmm. I would bring them into my house and I would treat them like they were a a brand new puppy almost. I would uh, have a crate set up when I went out, even though Shannon can lead them at their house on their own, I would put them in a crate at my house. I would supervise constantly to watch what they're doing. Um, I would never just let them, okay, you know, have a great day with Honda. Ned and Honda have a fun day together. Like it would... (laughs) It would just never go like that. It's no, yeah, absolutely. like management is so important. So very important. So the implications, of course, are that the dogs will keep each other company and that's going to solve this problem of the dog being alone and stressed or bored or whatever the whatever the intention was. There's also an implication in that commercial that the dogs are going to be instant best friends. Exactly, And that yes. opening the crate door is just going to make each of those dogs happy and excited to see each other. And there's a lot of things going on there. So I want to sort of dig into this a little bit. So first off, this one dog who already exists in the home there's territoriality that's going to go on mm-hmm. there. In addition, I think it's fair to say that that dog is not necessarily in his best mental state at that point mm-hmm. because he's already got some stress going on in the home, you know, whether it's just pure boredom and he's just never learned how to exist within the rules of the mm-hmm. house or whether he's actually, you know, really stressed out being alone, he's probably not the best role model, which is not realistic to begin with, but it is the implication Mm -hmm. in this commercial. So even if one dog could learn very well human rules in a human household from another dog, you're setting this situation up in this commercial where the dog is coming into another dog's space and there's already stress existing there. Mm -hmm. And in your opinion, what is going to happen there instead of this dog over here who already exists teaching the rules of the house, what's going to happen to the new dog? Well, the new dog's going to learn from the other dog that it's fine to tear up couches. It's Mm -hmm. fine to be stressed. It's fine to bark out the window constantly all day at people going by. So the the new dog is going to pick up on what the established dog is doing and you're going to have two you on your hands. Absolutely. Right. And that is exactly the problem. In all likelihood, it is going to backfire to the extreme. And now you're going to have two dogs tearing up the house instead of that one dog tearing up the house. And now you've got two stressed dogs because in all likelihood, if the first dog is stressed, the second dog is going to pick up on that stress as well. And even if he doesn't understand why there's stress in the situation yet, because this is a new situation for him, he is still going to feel that stress and he's probably going to engage in the same sort of activities Mm -hmm. to alleviate that stress, which is traditionally, you know, pacing, barking, chewing, things like that, Mm -hmm. that are really not going to be good in the long run for both dogs. Right. Yes. It's like if one of our, uh, you know, say, you know, one of our relatives, Uncle Joe is, is lonely. Uncle Joe. We, we spend more time with them and we do things with them and we, we think of activities to do with them. We just don't go and find you know, like, oh, well, here's here's a man over here who's lonely. Let's just toss them in the same house and leave them be and see what happens. <laughs> we, it's That's not how really we do funny it at all. Really true, absolutely. Right, yeah, we just don't, yeah. Oh, he just needs a friend. Here's a guy, like, let's just toss him in and see what happens. No, we don't do that. We go, no. okay, how can we help Uncle Joe? Yeah. Let's get him out and let's help him and do things. Absolutely. We don't solve problems by tossing another human in there. <laughs> So why would it work with our dogs? (laughs) Yeah, and this is such a golden point. I think that's so, so important. So you're probably not going to solve the problem in that way. You're probably going to create a much bigger problem for yourself. So Mm -hmm. the um, the other implication of the commercial is the quick fix. And I really hate that implication Mm -hmm. because when you're dealing with dogs, there are rarely quick fixes. I mean, there are certainly things that work and will work quicker than other things, but rarely is there ever a solution that is a singular vein that is going to solve this problem without you having to roll up your sleeves and do some work. And in this day and age, there's great access to information, but there is also 
great access to poor information. Mm -hmm. And we actually just did a YouTube video on uh, some of the biggest myths that we read out there on the internet and some of the worst advice that you, we can possibly see on the internet. And it was a really interesting process to get different opinions from different instructors and piece together this video sort of at, um, without us without us planning or preparing. We just got this opportunity to be asked questions that were, you know, dangerous mm -hmm. thoughts surrounding the Internet. And we got to have our natural reactions to that. And it was a, a really interesting video. And we got a little a lot of really good comments saying, you know, I didn't realize that I couldn't believe that piece of information from the internet, et cetera. Mm. We, we have this automatic response to news programs and things like that where an and internet now, it used to be TV so much, but if you remember the House Hippo commercial. Oh, I love the House Hippo yeah. commercial. I still want one. It's I still want one. Great. Absolutely. Me too. Mm -hmm. Where can I get mine? I don't know. I think they look like those hairless guinea pigs. Oh we gosh. could always get those skinny pigs, they're called. Yes. Yeah. If you have not seen the House Hippo commercial, Google House Hippo and you will see the commercial and you'll know what we're talking about. So basically it was a, a, a warning for kids, right? truth in advertising, mm -hmm. you know, it doesn't matter what the source is. You have to question things and whatever it is that you're looking at or listening to, you know, maybe there's an inkling of truth to it, but you always have to remember that there's different agendas out there. And, right. you know, just, just like with this commercial, the idea is to sell this warm, fuzzy feeling surrounding the equipment that is being purchased from Amazon, the mm -hmm. crate, et cetera. But unfortunately, the message that came through has got dog trainers the world over, you know, their right. hair standing on end. Yes. And, you know, yes. I wonder how many of us were like, Amazon, right. you nailed it in the first 10 seconds. Right. Yes. And then, boop, that rug came out right. from under yes. us. Because I know both of us had that exact same did, response yes, to it. Yes, And now that family has not only one untrained dog, now they ha probably have two untrained dogs. Yeah. So it's going to be double the training time, double the walk time, double everything now for those people yeah. rather than just taking the time to train their one dog. Yeah. And then once the one dog was trained, then they can bring in the other dog. Yes. You know, have, having two untrained dogs in a house at once is, is chaos. It is absolutely. And you, you just never know what's going to happen. So mm -hmm. let's dive into that a little bit. So we've talked about the need to train and the need mm -hmm. to work through this problem with this individual dog. And if it is separation anxiety, it's definitely something that we recommend that you see a qualified professional with because blanket information is not going to do very well in that state. A lot of dogs can get into what I like to refer to more as separation related stress. And that can be a precursor to separation anxiety. But at those first signs of separation related stress, that's a good opportunity to start to think about some of the routines that you're using and some of the precursors to you leaving, et cetera. And how are you, how are you leaving your dog when you're leaving the home? Are they they in a contained space or do they have access to the whole house? A lot of the times I think that um, people will often allow their dogs too much freedom in the home mm -hmm. without realizing what that does for the dog. So what do you think with a dog that is home alone, for example, uh -huh. what is that dog thinking in that moment? He's home alone and this is his territory. He's thinking... I'm not sure quite your, what, what, so, what, yeah. Shan's asking me tough questions today, <laughs> but I didn't the have a good, a good night's sleep either. So uh, I might just be a little bit off. <laughs> the tougher ones are yet to come. Yes. Oh. So I'm thinking in the safety realm and in the territory realm, and I'm thinking that a lot of dogs think, okay, this is my space right. that I okay. have to yep. take care of and right. I have to protect. Oh, and, okay. I get what you mean. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And that, that can put a lot of pressure on dogs. And basically if something does happen, like mm -hmm. the evil mailman comes right. to deliver male, now the dog is responsible for keeping everything safe. Mm -hmm. And the dog is also on their own and responsible for keeping themselves safe. Right. Yes. And they don't have a leader to look to, to say, mm -hmm. give me guidance. Should I be afraid of this mailman coming to the door or shouldn't I? Mm -hmm. Whereas if they are still young and if they're still not sure how to react to those things, being contained in a crate, that gives them feelings of safety and right. having that, that safe space yes. and, you know, something to occupy their time in mm -hmm. that safe space as right. well. So this sort of gets into the enrichment stage of things mm. and the enrichment side of things. And 
we always classify enrichments into two categories. What I, I always call them category A and category B. And category A is the good enrichments that include us. So mm-hmm. things like training, tricks, you know, all of the things that make us part of the picture for our dogs mm-hmm. and will enhance our relationship. And these are things that you can do ad nauseum. And, and I should preface that with a caveat that training should also include some trained downtime and a trained off switch so that it's not just constant go, go, go for the dog's mind. And then there's no downtime in there as well. It's really important to have, even with enrichment, you can overdo enrichment in so many ways. And it's really important to have a good balance and to have a dog that's not constantly looking for enrichment and that can shut off and have a good off switch Mm -hmm. in the house. And I think that's sort of a It's a road that we've gone down these days with our dogs that can sometimes get a little bit out of control because we just want to give them their best possible lives. Mm -hmm. So we're always looking for things to enrich them. And sometimes there's this constant enrichment, sort of like the kids with the video games and the kids with, you know, this concert, that concert Mm -hmm. and everything going on to sort of subsidize their lives and make their lives better, which in balance is great Mm -hmm. but when you're constantly being enriched there comes a need for more and more and more and the dogs tend there there's a lot of dogs out there that don't necessarily know how to come down and just relax so we always are good advocates and strong advocates of creating an off switch in the dog Mm -hmm. and making sure that the dog yes has a wonderful life and lots of training and lots of enrichment Mm -hmm. and you know in every way shape and form but they also know how to just be calm and just be a dog and they can be comfortable just relaxing in the house mm. and having, you know, having a joyous time by not doing anything. Right. Yes. Just like us reading mm-hmm. a book sort of thing. Um, so the enrichments from column B are things that don't involve us. And those are things like doggy daycare. There are things like dog parks, snuffle mats, you know, all of the things that bring enrichment to the dog's life, but in a self-serving kind of way or in a self-rewarding kind of way. And you can definitely overdo these enrichments very easily. We strongly recommend lots of enrichments from column A and small amounts of enrichments from column B. However, if you are a a working person and you have an eight hour work day that you need to go and spend outside of the home, obviously that's a long time for the dog. And we want to leave them with some things that will help to mentally stimulate Mm -hmm. them as well as we want to leave them with enough opportunity and time to rest and relax and sleep. And we're really, we're creating a a situation for the dogs. We're teaching them how to relax and Mm -hmm. how to be calm when we're absent. So we don't want to have too many things for them to do. I know um, a lot of times students will come in with with problems with their dogs being destructive in the home and we ask you know what sort of setup do you have for the home like where is the dog when Mm -hmm. you're out etc etc and they'll inevitably be even if it's a contained situation Mm -hmm. there'll be an x-pen with you know three or four snuffle mats and five stuffed kongs and you know in that case the dog's probably bouncing from one thing to the other to the other all day Mm -hmm. long and then when they lose interest in those things because they don't really know how to come down and just relax now they're looking for other things and that's when they can start to get into mischief outside of that little mm-hmm. world. Right. So. Yes. And even uh, one thing too is maybe a bit off topic, but having access to an open window where the dog can mm-hmm. bark, 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 and then he, he's all high from that barking yeah. and he turns around, he's got all that pent up energy and he's like, I see a pillow. That's gonna, a really good point. Yeah, pull it away. So yeah. I, um, you know, I never allow my dogs to have access to a, a window outside because it just riles them up too much. Gotcha. Yeah. And, and until they understand the rules of the house and how to relax from that, that is a really, really valid point. Actually, um, one of the few times that uh, I'm usually really good about management, I'm really good about training and I'm really good about, I'm very much a planner. So mm-hmm. I usually have my ducks in a row and I don't, uh, I'm very risk averse as well. So I don't tend to push the envelope mm-hmm. and allow my dog's freedom before I'm really confident that they're ready. But one of the few times that something got destroyed in my house was Reggie when he was a youngster. And this, oh. you just reminded me of this when you were, um, when you were talking about the window. Right. So I was shoveling mm-hmm. and because I was shoveling the front part of my house, he was inside watching me through the window. Right. And I guess he must have gotten really stimulated watching mm. me shovel because of course when I shovel off the back deck and whatnot the dogs are always part of that it's right, a game yep. and they get to go and chase, chase the, snow the snow as it flies yep. etc mm-hmm. and he took one of the pillows off my couch and right. I came in the house and there was a 
explosion <laughs> of little cloudy fuzzy things. He made his own snow. He did. <laughs> he made his own snow in the house and then I had to shovel that. Right. <laughs> but yeah, that's from him. He was yep, getting riled up by watching yep. and then he acted out. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So we were talking about enrichment. So having our dogs be able to come down and relax is such an important mm-hmm. part of things. Yes. How do you use enrichment when you, when you go out of the house? Do you leave your dogs with anything when they're crated? Usually they have one toy in their crate. Okay. I usually leave a nylon bone mm-hmm. or a Kong. Okay. Uh, and, th- and that's usually all they get left with in the crate. Perfect. Um, I will maybe play some um, calming music or have the TV running. So there'll be some background noise for them to listen to. Mm-hmm. Um, Actually, I want to talk on that right? note because we have been having incredible success yes. with the McCann Dogs Music Channel mm-hmm. for relaxing and calming. So if you are looking for some music or some noise, some background noise to leave on for your dogs, the McCann Dogs Music Channel has been bringing us great success. So give that a shot. Yes. And I've found it relaxing to listen to, too, because I've, is, I've I put agree. it on to, to check it out. And it's like, um, I like listening to yeah. this, too, especially the, well, at Christmas time. There was Christmas relaxing Christmas music, and I found it very nice as a background in the house nice and mm-hmm. you can find that on spotify or you can find it on our youtube channel the mccann dogs music youtube channel as well there's a couple of venues that you can find that in mm-hmm. okay sorry carry on right. i make sure the crate is in a, a spot where it's not going to get a direct sunbeam on it oh, or if there's any drafts or anything like that so it's in a, in a cozy area of the house where the dog feels secure mm-hmm. um they have a toy, maybe two toys, maybe at the most, and um, some music playing, and, th- and that's that. That's perfect. Yeah. And how does this situation evolve as you continue training and they continue learning the rules of the house? So when you decide that it is time to allow them a bit more freedom in the house in your absence, what does that look like? Well, I'll first pick a room, uh, you know, maybe the kitchen or the living room, somewhere when I can baby gate it off so they don't have access to the whole house. Okay. Uh, maybe the back of our house is like a laundry room, a mud room. And the first time I'm going to use a baby gate and I'm going to only leave them for maybe five minutes. Maybe I'm going to walk out the door, go to the mailbox and come back. Okay. And very casually, like when I leave the dog, I I often don't even say goodbye to them. I just, you know, put the baby gate up and I leave. So there's no big hype about me leaving. Then when I return, there's no hype also about me coming home. There's no party when I come home. I just take down the baby gate and go about my business. I love that. And that is such an important thing because a lot of the times we inadvertently create stress by making our comings and goings this big deal. And I know it's so tugs at our heartstrings Mm -hmm. when they're watching us and we're leaving the house, but it's so important to just not make a big deal out of Mm -hmm. your dog when your comings or goings. I don't even say goodbye to my dogs. Actually, sometimes with Reggie these days, he's 15. Uh You know, he's pretty content to be home by himself at this point and be uh, uh, enjoying his time on the big bed upstairs and just relaxing <laughs> and I'll often as I leave the house I'll just say okay see you in five minutes <laughs> it doesn't matter how long I'm gone for right. it's our little inside joke so mm. with um with that little statement though it's just a very nonchalant unimportant moment that you know I'm right. leaving the house and it's mm-hmm. no big deal and then when I come back I take off my coat and I take off my shoes and you know then I kind of turn around and go oh hey Reg and right. It's work. It really is. Because of course, when I come home and his sweet little face is there, I mm-hmm. want to be like, oh, Reggie, I missed you. And mm-hmm. I want to have a moment with him. But I have to rest- refrain myself from that. Restrain myself from that. Because mm-hmm. it doesn't do my dog any good right. in that moment. And it actually sets him up for failure the next time. Because if he's anticipating this big moment at my arrival, mm-hmm. then that's what he's going to be focusing on. And that will sometimes lead to some stress and lead to some anxiety as the dogs are, are headed for those, you know, the time when they know we're going to be home. And they pick up on things right. so, so yes. well. You know, they pick up on the extra traffic patterns mm-hmm. when it's five o'clock and they hear lots more, lots more cars coming mm-hmm. down the road or the buses maybe or whatever the case may be the kids on the school bus and all of those noises are triggers for them because of course they are waiting for our arrival right back home. yes especially with reggie he's waiting for my arrival home because he's waiting for dinner mm-hmm. <laughs> he wants his dinner <laughs> 
<laughs> oh my goodness. So in terms of those comings and goings from the house, I think it's really important to note that a lot of the times we accidentally create these patterns of stress. So yes. one way that we do that is through the uh, excited leaving or the sad leaving, I guess mm-hmm. would be more appropriate. Right, yes. The excited coming and the very sad going where we right. make a big deal out of it and we sound worried potentially because we're like, I'm going to miss you so right, much. Yeah, oh and- my gosh, you'll be good when I'm gone. And all yeah. of that will often lead to right. stress yes. for the dog. The, the dog can feel those emotions. Yeah. And it leaves him in a state of anxiety. Absolutely. Yes. And when they associate your worried tones with you then leaving the house, that starts to become a connected thing. Right. The other thing is for our really adept dogs as well, who are starting to build stress when we're mm-hmm. leaving is we often pattern things where we go to the door, we put on our hat and our mitts, we pick up our keys, mm-hmm. we unlock the door, we open the door, we close the door, we lock the door. So all of those things become precursors to the right. dog then becoming stressed. Stressed, and the mm-hmm. stress will start earlier and earlier. So I will actually make a point with my young dogs or if I've got a visiting dog in the home that I know is going to be there for a while that's a little bit older, mm-hmm. I'll make a point with those situations of going to the door 10 minutes before I'm going to leave and I pick up my keys and put them in my pocket at that point. Mm-hmm. So it doesn't get associated with me opening the door. Mm-hmm. Or I will go and put on my coat and mitts, you know, five minutes before mm-hmm. I'm about to leave. And then I walk through the house again or, you know, this one actually happens quite naturally naturally for me as I'm leaving the door my last thought is always oh should I go to the washroom quickly because (laughs) I tend to uh, I tend to drink a lot of coffee and then those long car rides of course can be torturous Mm -hmm. so a lot of the times I'll put on my coat and then I'll think oh should I use the bathroom before I leave and then I go back in and I use the bathroom Mm -hmm. so that sort of um, scenario where I've not put on my coat opened the door and left it becomes kind of a a more clouded scenario for the dog where they're not associating these definitive things with my mass exit. So Mm -hmm. I try to mix things up. Do you have anything in your your routine that you... Well, my my dogs are older now, but Mm -hmm. when they were younger, I definitely would... Yeah, sometimes I'd put them away long before I left too. So it'd be like, okay, you're back in your room. And Mm -hmm. um, now I'm, you know, I've got a couple other things to do and then I'm going to leave. So... Sometimes my my leaving time was longer than it wasn't you're away and I'm gone. Right. It was, okay, I'm putting you away. And then 15 minutes later, I'm finally going out the door. Right. But I find it interesting now if I leave the house and then I realize I've forgotten something mm-hmm. and I go back in the house, the dogs are always in their beds. It's Love like, it. oh, she left. Yeah. You know, they're never go milling sleep. about. They're 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 in their beds. Yeah. Yes. I love that. And Reggie too, if I if I do the same thing, if I forget something and I come back inside, he's already upstairs on the bed, mm-hmm. on his back, just enjoying life. And sometimes he doesn't even hear me coming or going again because he's deaf at this point. And he just figures when I'm gone. I'm gone and eventually he wanders down hungry and then I show up again. So (laughs) he's a funny little guy, but he's enjoying his retirement very much. So we worked at home uh, through COVID quite a bit and he got used to being home all day and not being in a crate in the back room at McCann's, which is where our dogs traditionally would be when we're at work. Mm -hmm. So I decided when I started going back into the office again that, you know what, he doesn't need to be in a crate room Mm. at McCann's at 15 years old. He is happy to be home all day, every day by himself, right. sleeping upside down on the mm-hmm. bed. And then he spends his evenings enjoying some time with us as well. Yes. So in the evenings, I do end up doing some more enrichment activities with Reggie mm-hmm. because at this point, of course, at 15, physically, he's not doing a lot of things, but I want to keep his mind sharp. So I use some some of the enrichments from column A. We'll still do some training and mm-hmm. we'll still do some trick training and things like that. It's a much more limited scale, of course, because he's he's not got the stick to that he had as a youngster, right. but he still loves doing stuff. So. Yes. yes. Well, I, I find too, I'll feed, um, if I know I'm going to be leaving Honda by himself for quite a long time. I might feed him his um, supper or breakfast out of the snuffle mat Mm -hmm. because it's a lot of mental energy. Yes. And he's got to snuffle around and find all that food. And then I find he's wiped out. Yeah. And so it makes it a little bit more, he's a little bit more tired when I leave him. Yeah, absolutely. So actually let's get into some of those solutions because when you are preparing to leave your dog for a long period of time, and you may or may not need to interrupt that midday and have somebody come in to let your dog out to go to the washroom, you know, our older dogs can hold it for a long time, mm-hmm. but sometimes our young dogs still need a little bit of, uh, of help midway through mm-hmm. the day. So you might consider hiring somebody to come in if you can't come in yourself and giving them a bathroom break. 
but if they are content going into that period of time because they've had some mental stimulation, you know, maybe you spend a half an hour in the morning doing some trick training, or maybe you spend some time with those enrichments from column B, so it takes some of the mental energy out. Mm -hmm. If you can meet the dog's needs, and dogs are really good at adapting to our schedule as long as we do meet their needs. Mm -hmm. So if you can meet the dog's needs, and then when you leave, they're content they're much more likely to relax and rest and then wait for you to get back home again. And then when you get back home again, you can spend a little bit of time with them in the evenings as well with those enrichment activities. And if you do it in a really good productive way, then you can actually alleviate any of these stresses and you can can set your dog up for a situation where they will be content through the day. You don't need to spend your entire lives enriching your dogs and you don't need to spend every waking hour enriching your dog, but you do need to do some things with them that will help them, you know, bring down their energy level and whatnot. And Mm -hmm. um, we always say you you can't put them up on the fireplace mantle through the week and then enjoy them on the weekends because they they need more than that. Yes. But we've also become this society where we think it's constant enrichment that they need. And the truth is somewhere in between. The truth is about balance Mm. and finding a good space for your dog in terms of that mental stimulation, especially. And I always like to remind people that if you are relying on physical stimulation, you are actually making your problem worse. So yes, they need some physical stimulation without question. And depending on the dog and the breed, that will vary mm. the level of mental st- or physical stimulation for right. me that they need. But the physical stimulation actually conditions them to need more physical stimulation. Mm-hmm. So the more you get out there and throw Frisbees for your young dog, the more they are going to need in order to feel satiated because right. you're conditioning an athlete. Yes. You know, when we go to the gym ourselves, we try to go on a systematic routine mm-hmm. so that we can actually condition ourselves to have more energy and have more muscle, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. And with our dogs, it is the exact same thing. Right. So a little bit of uh, physical stimulation, enough to meet their needs on that level, mm-hmm. but not pushing it to the point of exhaustion is so important. And then the mental stimulation. Tell us a little bit about what the mental stimulation does for the dog. Well, think of it as when you're learning a new task, you're learning a new computer program, or maybe your kids are studying hard for an exam. It mentally tires you out mm-hmm. and you become exhausted and you need that you need that mental stimulation. It, it's satisfying to complete yes. a task. And um, I've, I've bought over the years like, some of those little dog games, like little puzzles. Mm-hmm. And um, you can see the joy in the dog when they figure it out. Yeah. Like they figure out, you know, the, the tunnel system of how the kibble moves through and they flip it up with their nose and find it. And you can see that they're proud. So it's, um, the mental stimulation is so important. We want our dogs to feel satisfied. Um, if you think of a, a border collie herding sheep, that border collie has a sense of satisfaction when he's got the sheep to where he wants them to be. Oh, for sure. So, you know, or the, uh, the hunting dog, when they, you know, they've got the trail of a rabbit, they've, you know, they've done what they want to do. So we want to give our dogs that mental stimulation that they've had for generations and generations in doing their original work. Yeah, absolutely. And that is so important to remember. You know, there are so many different breeds out there to think about. And a lot of these breeds were bred for specific tasks. And even though those tasks aren't really a part of our lives anymore, you know, very few of us are sheep farmers. Lots of us like border collies, but very few of us are ever going to own sheep farms and be able to give the dog that work that they crave. And And I don't need my stuff taken to market in a cart. I don't need (laughs) a Rottweiler to pull my cart to market. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> absolutely. I, I love that. I love that. My first dog was a Rottweiler. So mm-hmm. of course that, um, that sits really well with me and hits home for me. Um, but they still need the work. And just because they don't have those tasks to do doesn't mm-hmm. mean that they couldn't run circles around us for eight hours a day, every right. day. So we go out to work and we come home and we're tired. But if they've been home all alone that whole time, they're going to have energy to burn. Right. So this is where, you know, choosing your breeds wisely Mm -hmm. is so important because in reality, if you are working all week long and then you just want to come home and put your feet up on the coffee table and watch Netflix in the evening, even if you're really busy on weekends, there's a lot of breeds that are not weekend warriors. They are full-time dogs Mm -hmm. and especially our working dogs. So if you are considering 
rearing a working dog, you're going to need to find things to help them be satiated through the week, to meet their needs through the week, you know, really do your homework and figure out what the needs of that particular breed that you're interested in is going to be and find a dog that is going to fit into your lifestyle so, so well that it's just going to be a match made in heaven rather than a frustration point for both you and the dog. Right. Yes. Yes. So many dogs are just, you know, they're understimulated, yeah. under-exercised and it's just, you know, it's, yeah, like, like I, you know, I've had Belgian Malinois and they mm-hmm. required a lot of work and yes, I was able to leave them, you know, eight hours while I went to work during the day. But you know what, before I left in the morning, I did work with them. Yeah. When I came home at night, I did work with them. Yeah. On the weekends, I did work with them. Yeah. I I wanted to be sure that the dog was, you know, I was treating the dog fairly. Yeah, absolutely. And that is such a critical thing for living harmoniously with our dogs. So keep that in mind. You know, if you can think about how to strategically plan these things, you will be able to spend less time through the week and then mm-hmm. you can do the weekend warrior thing and you'll be able to meet the dog's entire needs in the entirety of the week instead of just on the The weekends. Yes. So a little bit of time in the morning, a little bit of mental and physical stimulation. And if you're not sure how much is too much, keep a diary, keep a little journal of your dog and what has worked and what has not worked. And of course, this is especially important as you are looking to give them more freedom in the house. So the structure and the crating is great for our young dogs, but then as they grow up, we do want to be able to leave them loose when we're leaving for work for that eight hours in the day. So You want to know as much about your dog as you possibly can when they get to that point. And the best way to do that is just to track, you know, Mm -hmm. okay, so he was in his, um, he was in his relaxed mode for a full eight hours today. And when I got home, he was bouncing and full of beans and I only did 15 minutes of exercise and fun with him in the morning. Then tomorrow, okay, so I did 20 minutes of trick training before I went out. And when I got home, he was much more relaxed. Mm -hmm. You know, you just make notes about about what works for your dog, when and how. And over time, you're going to make, you're going to be able to make connections that are going to serve you very well and give you very good information. Right. Yes. I just, with uh, my Sheltie Atari, she um, came from a strong herding bloodline. And I remember thinking to myself so many times that she would love to have a chicken or a duck that <laughs> she could boss around and herd all around. And, um, but of course, I, you know, I live right in the city, so I couldn't get her a chicken. I think if I lived out, 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 uh, out I would have out in the country. But instead what I did was I got- Next um, Amazon commercial. <laughs> yeah. Out comes a chicken, chicken from the crate. <laughs> for Atari. Because <laughs> she loved, you could just see, she wanted, she had that herding breed kind of bossy, like, you know, I want to move things. Yeah. So what we did instead was we got a, um, a large kid kids plastic ball from Walmart. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, they're about that big. And, um, you know, we encouraged Atari to push that around and we'd kick it and she would push it places and we'd kick it and she'd push it places. And that was kind of her chicken. And um, (laughs) she loved to move that ball around with her nose and have us to kick it and try to play keep away. And we had a lot of fun with that ball. And um, it, it it gave her some mental stimulation that kind of, you know, sort of related a little bit instead of hurting a chicken she was hurting this big ball around i love that that's great and really dogs are really happy if we meet their needs most of the time they're really happy to go okay now i'm gonna nap until Mm -hmm. the next time i have needs that need to be met so until there's another ball that needs to be hurted yeah Mm -hmm. absolutely so i think that the takeaway from this episode should be don't look for quick fixes Don't expect to solve your problem of a lonely dog by bringing in another dog. You're probably just going to exacerbate your problem. It is very rare that that would actually be a solution. Right. Well, it's, well, it's nice for them to have a buddy to hang out with through the day. It's got to be the right buddy. You want to make sure that they're well-trained enough that they understand the rules of the house before you introduce another dog. And then remember that you're going to have to go through that same process with the other dog as well. There really are not quick fixes and it's going going to be a little bit of a nicer time. I should say a lot of a nicer time if you go about it with a realistic expectation rather than, you know, this really lovely, warm feeling that this poor lonely dog is now getting a friend and he's not going to be lonely anymore. But sadly, that is it's, really yes. not reality. Right. Uh, when one of my corgis passed away and my one corgi had never been dogless before and I felt bad for him, but I didn't get him another puppy. (laughs) 
I got him a canary. Oh, okay. That's interesting. <laughs> so, Let's talk about that. Right. So um, I knew I wanted to get another puppy. Mm-hmm. And, um, but, uh, you know, I was waiting for the right one to come along. Okay. And so it took, you know, I think it was a good year before the right puppy, you know, I, I it was, the female was bred and I got the puppy I wanted. And um, so we bought a canary and we named him Sprout. Aww. And he was the most wonderful singer. And I thought now Gavin, that was the Corgi, doesn't feel alone in the house. There's, there's another living being in there when we go mm-hmm. out. Now, at first when we brought the canary home, we blocked off his cage so Gavin couldn't get anywhere near it. Of course. I wouldn't want to come home and find no. the canary in, <laughs> in Gavin's tummy. <laughs> but um, so, but you know, we put the canary in the house and that made me, you know, it's like there's something else in the house. He's not by himself and the beautiful singing and uh, we love that canary. It was a Aww. really good addition. So um, Sprout. You know, just, yeah, Sprout, little Sprout. He was green and yellow. So, you know, just adding something, you know, small like that. If you yeah. want to look after, remember, you have to look after these animals That's too. exactly it. So, you know, they're extra costs, they're extra time, extra mm-hmm. food. But, um, you know, I, I felt that was kind of a nice, a nice way to give another living being in the house. Yeah, absolutely. And without that potentially becoming a disaster, because chances are Sprout wasn't looking for advice from Gavin. No, no. <laughs> Perfect. All right. Thank you so much, Swanee. That was a great episode to do. So if you are thinking about adding another dog to your household, some great tips for you to be able to do that. And on that note, I'm Instructor Shannon. I'm Instructor Swanee. Happy training. 